Welcome everyone. Today we are talking about something practically nobody has talked about before on YouTube, which is the emotional appeal of something known as Calvinism. We will be looking at the topic from the perspective of the acronym TULIP, which outlines the core beliefs of most Calvinists. Each letter of the acronym can be used to provide an emotional benefit like assurance, a confidence boost, comfort, and relief, among many others, which aren't bad in themselves, but can be used to promote pride as well as distract from the truth. Today, we will talk about the emotional appeal of Calvinism. Before we start, we need to talk about some disclaimers. No, 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 this is not a video where we are all going to say, oh, Calvinists are biased, and that's why people are Calvinists. That, that's silly. In fact, you can agree with everything I say in this video and it will not diminish the truthfulness of Calvinism in any way. That's comforting. You should still listen to the best arguments for the truth of it to see if it's correct, in my opinion. What I say also doesn't apply to all Calvinists. Many of what I say applies to other belief systems as well, not just Calvinism. We don't want this video to be a look at all those people who are so biased. I'm so much better than them. We all make most of these mistakes in some aspect in our life. The important thing is if we are aware of it. More on that later. Finally, I should note that I think the overwhelming majority of Calvinists don't consciously think if I accept this view, this is the benefit I get. No, not usually. From a psychological perspective, it is subconscious. It's a good feeling one gets, a sense of assurance, safety, and therefore conclude uh, that that feeling, whatever I feel when I when I believe such a thing, when I hear such a view, this view must be right because I get a good feeling from it. It's very similar to wishful thinking. You want it because of the good feeling and therefore you are more likely to come to that conclusion. To start, the T in TULIP stands for total depravity, which teaches that as a consequence of the fall, every person born into the world is enslaved to the service of sin as a result of their fallen nature. And apart from the efficacious, irresistible, or prevenient, in other words, enabling, grace of God, is completely unable to choose by themselves to follow God, refrain from evil, or accept the gift of salvation as it is offered. This is often described as corrupt from my very nature, unable to see spiritual things, moral inability to do good apart from God. Surprising to many, this view is very affirming for people who are very down on themselves, not confident, people that think they are worthless. Being told, yeah, you are desperately wicked and corrupt to someone who messes up constantly, to someone who feels like they haven't been heard, can surprisingly be very comforting. It's very similar to how if someone has a death in their family or goes through a breakup, they're sad, depressed life seems terrible. Many in that situation, they won't listen to happy music to make them feel better. Rather, they turn on sad music and just dwell on the pain. Kind of like how if a woman comes from work upset about what happened. This certainly happens with men too, but the stereotype is that men want to problem solve. But the woman, she doesn't want that. The woman in this stereotypical scenario wants the man to say, oh wow, that is so terrible that you had to go through that. They want someone to relate, affirm that they are right to feel that way, and they most certainly don't want someone to tell them that they are wrong. In the situation of Calvinism, believing that one is totally depraved is paradoxically affirming. This might sound really odd, you might ask. Why would someone be okay with being told they were totally depraved? If one were told God thinks they are morally bankrupt, evil, that they can do nothing good, why would they not be offended and reject such a view? Because to many people, that's, that's actually how they feel. They see that it confirms how they felt for a long time and is therefore evidence that this interpretation of the Bible is true. But it's still upsetting, right? Being told all those terrible things, surely that's offensive in some way. But not, not always to the Calvinists, because all the Calvinists have to do 
is to believe in Calvinism. And they realize not only are they not totally depraved anymore, rather they become the elect, those chosen for salvation. All they have to do is accept the belief and they can now conclude God thinks they are good, special, and valuable. The fun thing about being one of the elect that God chose is that it is really easy to come to the belief that you're better than everyone else who isn't elect. Yes, I realize that said Calvinists believe that it was God who did everything to make them part of the elect, but it still can be very attractive to someone who isn't confident in themselves to compare themselves to those who are totally depraved. Some people find a lot of enjoyment in tearing everyone else down. So do you want to know what's wrong with Washington? It's total depravity. You want to know what's wrong with Hollywood? It's total depravity. Looking down on others because they are worse off. And with transgender operations, with homosexuality and lesbianism and child abuse, you want to know what the problem is? The problem is the human heart. Oftentimes, a sermon on the doctrine of total depravity essentially becomes an entire conversation of those people are terrible, we aren't like those people. Because once you believe Calvinism is true, you realize that you are not totally depraved because of course God elected you. So you are no longer part of that bad crowd. Not only are you not bad, but you are in the chosen crowd, specifically by God. More on this later. Next on the tulip, we have unconditional election. R.C. Sproul defined it as saying, Unconditional election means that God does not foresee an action or condition on our part that induces him to save us. Rather, election rests on God's sovereign decision to save whomever he is pleased to save. This can be, of course, really reassuring for people because someone who feels they aren't worthy realizes that if their salvation is not based on their worthiness, there is no way they lose it. Someone who knows they make mistakes and sins all the time realizes they don't have to worry when they make mistakes because their election wasn't based on that. That is massive comfort. I will say that the normal person out there probably doesn't relate much to this, but there is a large amount of people out there that freak out every time they sin for a number of different reasons. Sometimes it's because they are under the impression that they have to ask for forgiveness every time they sin. Otherwise, if they somehow die without asking for forgiveness, God could send them to hell. I can't tell you how many people I've met that have struggled with if they are really saved or not. Realistically speaking, it's impossible to know if you are saved with certainty. One could always ask, how do you know that you're going to go to heaven one day? One might ask, well, did you ask Jesus into your heart? The answer would be obviously yes, but how do you know if you actually meant it? What if you said the wrong words or had unrepentant sin when you did that? Someone may be struggling with addiction. The pastor says, God will help you with your addiction, but you've been praying and praying and nothing happens. That makes it really easy to doubt whether one is saved. All these problems appear to be solved if you just accept the belief that it has nothing to do with you that it has all to do with God that saves you. Talk about a load off your shoulders. You don't have to worry about messing up ever again. You can't mess it up yourself because it was God who did it all to begin with. Unconditional election is fun because it's a great chance to tell everyone how great you are. You know, because you are one of the elect, but you can do it in a way where you can also tell yourself you are such a humble person because you tell everyone it was all God. That brings us to the L in TULIP. L for limited atonement. Teaches that Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross was specifically intended to secure the salvation of the elect, those whom God has chosen for salvation. It asserts that Christ's atonement was effective and sufficient to save the elect completely without any need for additional sacrifice or atonement. Of course, that means that the atonement is limited as it doesn't atone for everyone. There's the long list of people that are not elect that are not atoned for. This is one of the most obvious ones that can make someone feel extra special about themselves. Jesus died only for the elect, not those 
other bad people. You're not part of the perishing. You're among the saved. But for you and the rest of your group you're in, God chose you guys. Beloved by the Lord, you are chosen by the Lord, you are saved by the Lord, you are sanctified by the Lord, you are called by the Lord, and you will be glorified by the Lord. If that wasn't bad enough, before we are regenerated, Calvinists claim we are unable to understand the gospel among other things, and therefore when God saves us, he gives us all kinds of new abilities. People describe this in a number of ways. It makes you alive, able to see, able to understand, gives a new heart so that you are able and will believe the gospel. You're not totally depraved anymore, unlike those other people. God literally elected you. You were loved by the Lord. What would make someone feel more special about themselves other than being told they were the elect? All you have to do is believe in Calvinism, and you get all these benefits we have talked about so far. It puts people in a place of security, that I'm not going to be left by Jesus. That's comforting. Feels that void of a lack of confidence. I can now say I'm more special than everyone else. It supposedly removes all doubts, because we know God was the one who gave us that extra ability to choose him, and therefore we can't lose it ourselves. As a Calvinist, it is easy to conclude that if one is more knowledgeable about the Bible, it's because God gave said person knowledge. Therefore, it's easy to conclude they must be extra special compared to all the other Christians for God to bless them with the teachings of Calvinism. Now for the I in irresistible grace. This is the belief that the grace of God, when extended to an individual for their salvation, cannot be resisted or thwarted. In Calvinist theology, this grace is efficacious. Did I, did I pronounce that right? I have no idea. And effectively brings about the regeneration and conversion of the elect, enabling them to respond in faith and repentance. It emphasizes God's sovereignty and salvation, asserting that those whom he has chosen for salvation will inevitably and irresistibly come to faith in Christ. This just adds to the relief of performance pressure. If God is the one doing it, like we don't even have a choice in the matter, we don't have to worry about messing up because we can't even make the choice to do otherwise. Thousands of Christians out there struggle with whether they can lose their salvation and the fear of going to hell if they make a mistake. Calvinism allows for all control to be given to God, which completely removes the pressure. Finally, we have P for Perseverance of the Saints, often referred to as once saved, always saved, which is a theological doctrine that teaches the eternal security of the believer. It asserts that those who are truly born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit and justified by faith in Jesus Christ, will continue in faith and obedience until the end of their lives, ultimately being glorified and saved. In essence, it affirms that genuine believers cannot lose their salvation, but will persevere until the end, kept secure by the power and grace of God. This is a huge one because people of all denominations deal with doubt of whether they will go to heaven or not. You can either exist forever in eternity, or you cannot exist forever. And I think both of them are equally terrifying. I, I thought to myself, I was like, well, if God would come down and tell me, you know, hey, I'm real and you're going to be uh, you're going to be just fine. Would that make me feel good? Yeah, it would. It's a scary feeling knowing you are a sinner of which can die and go to hell. Calvinism gives one the security knowing they will not go to hell. As long as they accept that they are the elect, they're good to go. There's a famous phrase in Calvinism. It is, if you didn't do anything to gain salvation, you can't do anything to lose it. When we put all of them together, Calvinist beliefs put God in odd conundrums. If God determined those who would be saved, he also determined that those who won't be saved will go to hell, while also never giving those who go to hell the ability to ever decide otherwise. This is similar to a parent telling their child to eat, never giving the child food, and then punishing the child for not listening when the child doesn't eat. Many Christians think that if this were true, it would make God immoral, and therefore they seek to interpret Bible verses in other ways. 
rather than interpret a passage differently. This allows a Calvinist the chance to say that the Calvinists are really the ones who interpret the Bible according to what it says, therefore reasserting that feeling of being better than everyone else. A common phrase we hear is, God is sovereign, which means he makes the rules. This can easily turn to a statement of, I'm such a good person because I think so highly of God, especially not like those other people. Finally, this line of thinking can easily lead to one thinking their team, the Calvinists, are the only ones who really believe the Bible about God. The Calvinists are the only ones who really believe the Bible regarding God because Calvinists actually accept it rather than others who reinterpret passages with their feelings. Once one believes that God regenerates them to Calvinism, there's an extra bit of confidence that their view is right. Yes, it was because God allowed them to open the eyes, but their eyes are still open. They have a better ability to see, and therefore that's, of course, in their eyes, why they conclude Calvinism. This can be harmful because if they are in fact wrong about any theological matter, not even Calvinism in general, it can be tempting for many to think that God gave them this extra ability to read God's word better and therefore will have a lower chance of being open to other ideas because of course they contradict with what said Calvinist believes already. They would be less likely to come to the conclusion because they specifically believe that it was God who pushed them towards Calvinism or these other beliefs in general. In explaining why Calvinists have a negative stereotype, Jared Wilson says, The doctrines of grace serve for so many as a kind of special knowledge of the scriptures that others don't have, or at least that the Calvinist didn't have before he was a Calvinist. Now truth has been unlocked. He sees something others don't. He's been enlightened. Unfortunately, having this experience can be a huge temptation to pride where the one now enlightened sees other Christians as unenlightened. I think there are many reasons why there is a negative stereotype, but as we have seen, almost every way that Calvinism distinguishes itself from other denominations just happens to include beliefs that are so easily able to be used to bolster pride and therefore more easily attracts those kinds of people. Another interesting way Calvinism makes people feel better about themselves is due to it being what people call a systematic theology. It is a set number of preset clear beliefs which give a sense of safety and security because all you have to do is look to the list for your answers. We'd be here all day, but there were a couple things I wanted to mention that don't specifically have to do with Calvinistic theology that affects the, the typical Calvinist out there because of its strong appeal. Oftentimes, non-Calvinist churches, in an effort to prevent one from having a wrong view of God or becoming prideful, try to keep the Calvinistic arguments away from others and fear that they will accept such a terrible belief. So when someone does come across the realm of Calvinism, well, it comes off as hidden, newly found wisdom to the Calvinists. It's easy to feel good about oneself when they think one is extra super smart because one takes a view others don't even know about. Considering many find their identity in Calvinism, whether that be the teaching themselves or simply the good feeling they get for believing, there tends to be a group mentality where Calvinists go to Calvinist churches who all agree with each other, which contribute to a sense of belonging and understanding. What I wanted to talk about last is probably the most important thing. If a Calvinist accepts any other view other than Calvinism, they lose all of these things that make them feel good, that give their sense of confidence, identity, pride from reading the Bible more seriously than others, extra ability to read God's word, assurance of salvation, among other things. So when you give someone your strongest argument against Calvinism, or if you're deciding to be extra spicy, you compare Calvinists to child sacrificers, it should be no wonder why they freak out and possibly don't even listen to what you're saying. They, they can't because they're too freaked out at even the small possibility that everything that is giving them any sense of purpose or identity might be gone because it's untrue, because it's similar to child sacrifice. As we have said before, it's not a conscious thought, it's a vague concept of the belief. You aren't thinking, oh, I'm going to lose this benefit, what makes me happy about life. But it does make one uncomfortable to lose what you associate with that belief of Calvinism. Kind of like a relationship where 
they aren't thinking, oh, I'm so sad because I now lost all of these benefits from dating this person. There are many different reasons to be sad about a breakup, but one in particular is the sadness of losing what good feelings are associated with said person. So what is the solution? How do we, Calvinist or not, find truth when we are tempted to believe things based on, on how they will benefit us or make us feel? The biggest thing is that, one, we have to recognize when we get that feel-good feeling, that prideful prideful thought. Recognize when you believe something and there just happens to be an emotional benefit with it. I know for me it's subconscious. Recognizing is one of the biggest things you can do. Once you recognize, start to question yourself. Why does that make me feel so good? Is there a fear or sadness that this view is helping me solve? Maybe there's a much deeper insecurity there. Make sure to like and subscribe for more content like this. And don't forget to check out our most recent video here on what Warren McGrew said about infant damnation and child sacrifice.